with something that's purely digital, such as finance, it's incumbent upon the industry to look at the fact that you can change infrastructure and regulations really quite quickly if you can agree to do so. And, and that agreement could be in the blink of an eye. And I've been saying to people, look, if you just took a clean sheet of paper and arrived and looked around at the way the world actually is and then built rules around that and studied it and then threw in a little bit of money, like a billion pounds, a small amount, because it's home finance, it has to start at that scale, then you'd be able to do extraordinary things. And people would say, oh, no, no, don't load too many features onto this. And, you know, the story of Pathways that we're saying, well, we're going to do just one thing. When I describe it, people say, why are you trying to do 15 things? I said, well, no, we're going to do one thing. It just, life is complex. <laughs> Don't ask me for the simple version. People live complex lives. I'm going to help them with that one thing, the complex life. So that is the simple <laughs> version. <laughs> well, I think we've got the, uh, the intro snippet right there. So let's jump into the, the interview proper. I haven't done this entirely scientifically, but I hope you'll bear with me was scrolling the property websites this morning. I found a two-bed, two-bathroom flat for sale in South Croydon, London at £695,000. I also found a similar flat in the street next door, renting for £2,200 a month. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to assume those are the same flat for the moment. If you were to rent that flat for 25 years, which is the average term of a new British mortgage, you would end up paying your landlord significantly more than the purchase price, even on an inflation-adjusted basis. So just buy the flat yourself, right? But there's a big affordability problem here. Remember the rentals are inflation-adjusted, so they're always rising. At a 3% CPI, the 2200 a month you pay today becomes 3000 a month by year 12, becomes nearly 4500 a month at the end of your term. Your mortgage, meanwhile, is steady, which is a long way around of saying that, and I'm skipping some points, but basically, if 2200 a month was all you could afford to pay in your budget, you would need to put a down payment of £250,000 on that flat to get your repayments low enough. And needless to say, not every home buyer has that sort of cash lying around. But that's the only difference, right? That access to capital. If you have it, and you can therefore pay for the home on a steady scale, then not only do you have a place to stay for 25 years, not only do you pay less overall, but you end up owning the underlying asset and you benefit from years of tax deductions and credit score boosts. If you don't have that capital and you therefore have to pay for the house on an escalating scale, you get none of those benefits, which sounds a bit all or nothing for the single biggest transaction in almost all of our household budgets, but maybe not for long. Welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan LaGrange for one of the most exciting stories I've recorded so far. E.K. Udechuku, welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers. Today we're recording in Brown Bear Studios in the heart of what is hopefully still a sunny Brighton when we leave. For me, as a sort of enthusiastic uh, amateur, (laughs) I've recorded all 80-odd of my previous episodes by myself, so a little bit intimidating to be surrounded by actual professionals, but also, yeah, a big treat. And in some ways, it's a bit similar to be talking to someone with your sort of track record. A huge treat, but also a little bit intimidating. So you're here to talk about Pathway, which is this hugely ambitious project that's going to be disrupting not just two marketplaces, but two really important, really big marketplaces being pensions and home ownership or, or rentals. So yeah, I'm itching to to get into that. But before we do, as I said, you've got this background that's really impressive, but also quite exotic. So let's not skimp on talking about that. I think if you're looking for a founder's origin story, one that collides with the topic of the day, you sort of go back to relationships and um, precocity. When I was a teenager, (laughs) I had a personal crisis. Um, My mother died when I was 17. But I was also one of these kids who was pushed forward in the education system in a very African way, a pushy African mother. When we arrived in Australia, the timing of British education year-end for schools and starting in Australia was mismatched. So she said, my son must go forward because it's a shame on the family 
if a son goes back in school as sort of the Nigerian mother's perspective. So I ended up being, you know, two years younger than most of my peers in high school. Because yeah, you start a year earlier I, as well. Yeah. I started a year earlier and then I moved from Western Australia to the East Coast where people start even later. <laughs> so I was three years younger than everybody around me. And so when my mother died at 17, I was most of the way through an economics degree and halfway through a law degree at 17, running errands for suburban lawyers who were transferring property. So going down to Landredge, filing $100,000 property transactions at 17. And I was headhunted by the Australian Treasury a month before my 19th birthday to work as a graduate economist because I'd finished my degree. And a year later, I was working with Morgan Stanley and Solomon Brothers and Nomura Bank, borrowing money for the Australian Treasury to finance the deficit. So you just start with this precocious exposure to ridiculously large numbers and realize, well, the zeros don't take up very many pixels on the screen or <laughs> very much ink on the page. It's just numbers. And that's, that's kind of the guiding philosophy behind a new consumer brand <laughs> that just says, well, it's just numbers. Let's just talk to ordinary people about big numbers and just let them get used to it. Yeah. And you can see when you're in that area how you know, finance people can become ungrounded because it does just become numbers on the screen. But you've stayed very grounded, you know, a lot of social impact work as well. And I think that's probably the challenge for somebody in that space is not to get lost in the just another zero here or another zero there. And as you say, when you're running a country, the, the numbers get big very quickly. Now, as I said, it's not just banking. I mean, the second half of your career has been more defined by, by founding and founding several times. The first time I moved abroad, it was to move to Copenhagen to, to start a new job. You know, we arrived in country, my you know, first day at the office. I was gifted a lovely bouquet of flowers, and they were put in a little glass vase, which I took home to my wife, who was at the hotel, to pretty up the room. The vase it was in, I thought, was just the free vase that comes from the florist. A little bit short to be practical, funny little shape, but it was the only thing we had. You know, we, we were in a service department. We didn't have anything else, so I took it, and I, we used it. We kept it when we moved into our first apartment in Copenhagen, and I packed it with everything else when we moved to Hong Kong. And only later found out, talking to a friend and colleague from there, that that was the vase that everybody got flowers in. You were definitely not supposed to take it home. It was an Alva Alto finished glass vase that was worth a few hundred pounds uh, that I accidentally stole and still own. And actually, when we went to get Finnish visas for my youngest daughter, on the wall of the Finnish consulate in Hong Kong are the, the original sketches of the vase. So it's now become a talking point. But it's not a mistake you would have made because mid-century uh, Scandinavian design, mid-century Scandinavian furniture and art is an area of passion of yours as well. So talk to me about Ampersand House. Well, um, Pathways are bond market arbitrage, which means very little to most people. But occasionally the bond markets crash. And last year, we noticed that in Britain, even uh, when you're looking at government bonds. But in 2007, when people talk about the 2008 crash, it was actually the 2007 bond market crash. And I was working with um, Bank of America at the time. And my world came to an end because my clients were banks. I was working for a bank that works with banks and on the bond market side, big banks were falling out of the sky like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. So we ended up taking a role with a financial institutions focused private equity fund in Luxembourg that said, well, we need someone who can help us buy and sell asset management businesses and small insurance companies and consolidate them into a vehicle in Luxembourg. And when I moved to the Benelux region, realized that there were massive properties. We'd left uh, a small two-bedroom um, place in Notting Hill about five or six years before that experience in Luxembourg. And these houses like the Spanish consulate in, on Avenue Moliere in uh, uh, Brussels were worth roughly the same as a, like a small um, two-bedroom apartment in Notting Hill. And at that point in time, Catherine, my co-founder, was working at King's College teaching commercial law. And she had an experience coming across these 1930s library cabinets, beautiful oak cabinets, were being thrown away because furniture from the middle of the century, this is, uh, if you think about the 1990s, is a 60-year-old cabinet. Who needs these beautiful old cabinets? So she said, I will take them home. Somehow she got them on a truck and they <laughs> arrived and we've had them ever since. <laughs> it's like a 1930s cabinet and an 1830s home and people said, oh, that looks really good. And that sort of mixture of things which were no longer new but which looked contemporary in an ambiguous way. And you look at an Eames chair designed in the late 40s, and it looks pretty much like it was designed yesterday, but that was 80 years ago. 
So that moved us on to, you know, Alvar Alto and Arnie Jacobson and, and the whole gang. People would ask us, can you help me with our place? You know, in between your day job, teaching commercial law or, or working at Morgan Stanley, can you give us some hints? And we loved it. So we wanted to open a gallery. That idea didn't get off the ground until we got to Brussels, where the space, the physical space, if you can think of the era when Napoleon uh, III redid Paris and then, you know, the uh, Leopold II said, well, we can do better in Brussels, went to the Congo and took everything and brought it back to Brussels and rebuilt it, just an excess of magnificent townhouses. When you photograph a low-lying Scandinavian daybed in a hugely you know, four-meter-high um, salon in Brussels, and then you take the word Brussels out, just put the picture on the internet and say it's ampersand house, beautiful, stylish, sumptuous. The photograph elevated the value of the furniture. So some movie, movie producer in, in California would say, well, what's the price on that thing? And we would just ship things to New Zealand or California or, you know, someone's doing a, a, a hotel resort in Switzerland or something. So people would visit us from all over the world and buy pieces that we loved and lived in, used, taking lamps off the wall, unscrewing them, etc. Completely meaningless project uh, financially. Except, of course, if you look at what we paid for the house and to redo the house and what we made using the aesthetics of the house to upgrade the value of furniture... It was a yield play, you could say. We were using the income from the house as if we had a tenant. Looked at that way, it was a, a way of buying an asset that didn't go down, the house itself, and then making money using the house as if you had tenants or a hotel or a restaurant. In some ways, similar to, to podcasts and YouTube and those things where you create the community, you create the beautiful thing that elevates everything else because it's seen in its best light and that it allows people to imagine what it could be versus grandmother's old chair that you grew up with and just don't recognize until you see it in the right light cleaned up a bit and photographed well and you see okay it doesn't need to be down on its luck happens all the time in scandinavia that you would get to be literally grandmother's old furniture has been in the attic and there are these auction houses which are now online so you can sit in london and review all the regional auction houses in finland by flicking through some pixels and if you have a network of trucks and people who can upholster furniture, as we developed, then you can just say, I'll buy that one, because you start to recognize that's a good example of its type. It's damaged, but I know someone who can fix it. Oh, that one's damaged beyond repair. You could see from a picture because you just trained your eye and you sat and physically touched these things. So it becomes a, you know, a business husband and wife team. <laughs> all the businesses we've started have been the tours, and they've all been a reflection of our passions for education, for art and design and finance really <laughs> yeah but i love that as well that it's not just about the collection i mean it's it's about sitting in the chair and, and seeing it and yeah you know, let's not get too far off track i said that was also a point in your career that you sort of moved from working in banks and you've since then done you said well several businesses you founded with your wife how did those earlier businesses lead you to to pathway i think the probably the best way to settle on it is a husband and wife team <laughs> who are looking at houses and love of the aesthetics, but also a knowledge of the, the yield. And so you start to think, as an economist, <laughs> in my case, there are conflicts of interest between landlords and tenant. The landlord wants to spend as little as possible. They want the house to go up in value, but they don't really want to fix a dripping tap. There are you know, house-proud tenants who do work on behalf of their landlord, and the landlord kind of lets them do it. <laughs> and uh, a couple of experiences just, uh, you know, when I first met Catherine, we were living in Canberra, Australia, and in a rented place, uh, my first rented place, as I started to work at the Treasury. And there was some, let's say, wallpaper scratchings on the wall from the previous tenant. And I said to the landlord, you're going to fix that, aren't you? And he said, well, I'll lower your rent a bit if you go and pick the color you want and do the work for me. I won't pay for your work, but I will pay for the materials and you get to choose. In the pathway concept, the landlord and the tenant buy the house together and the landlord says, well, if you look after the house, I'll give it to you one day. That's basically the sort of, I'll lower your rent if you do some work for me, or I'll give you a share of the value of the house. If your monthly rent comes in a thousand, a thousand, a thousand every month, and you want to spend money on my garden because I bought the house, I'll skip two months of rent. You go buy the trees you want, put them in the garden, and then we'll come back to paying rent again. It's really yeah. very much about just a trade between a family that owns a house and a family that's looking after the first family's interest. But then you just change one paragraph in the lease agreement that says, and if you pay enough rent, that's just so much rent over so many years, I'll just give you the house because that's just enough. You know, that, that social equity comes in a single paragraph where we say with respect to the house, if you can pay 1000 a month, 
I'll show you all of the houses in your neighborhood where a thousand a month is good value for money for you. And it's good money for value for me that the rent I receive, the money is high compared to the houses. And because a thousand is all you can afford, I'll make them all a thousand a month and then go buy the ones that you want and become your landlord because we've chosen the house together and chosen to redo the roof and insulate it together. And the economics of reducing your gas bill goes to you. But I'll take that into account when we set yeah. set the value the house will show you. We'll show you slightly cheaper houses if you also want me to redo the roof. Just choosing together and how what works for you, what works for me. It's a very different way of thinking about finance. I love that because as someone who's, who's, who's rented a few times, I've rented more recently in a, in a house, beautiful house, stunning view. We got it for an affordable price for us because it was in a state of somewhat disrepair. And it kind of worked for us because we had young kids. It takes the stress away. They could not do any more damage than it was. But you're paying a fortune in heating. It's doors don't all close properly. Little things that you say, well, I wouldn't mind spending a few thousand in getting these done. But as a tenant, the, the owner in that case, and not because they were kind of cold-hearted landlord, but because they're waiting to knock it down to develop. So he wasn't looking to invest for, for that reason. But yeah, you have that conflict. And it doesn't need to be. You both could really have a harmonious uh, relationship. And you know, talk about pathway, bringing together the, the, the landlord and the tenant. It's also got that financing side. So I think we'll deep dive a little bit more of how you make this work for consumers, um, because that's kind of where I'm a bit more comfortable. But before we get there, let's talk about the more investment banking side, the funding side. How is this also a play in the pension area? How does this in any way uh, impact how pensions might choose to invest or how investors might find different asset classes? Uh, it's a very good question, and it, it's worth warning the uh, whoever's going to listen to this that it's all maths. Uh, so if you, if you look at the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio line in the movie, Don't Look Up, when he's asked to explain why are you confident this asteroid is going to hit the Earth, but please don't use maths. He says, well, the probability that it hits the Earth is all maths. What do you want me to say? <laughs> so we just look at bond yields and deconstruct um, obscure instruments like an inflation-linked guilt and, it, and say, well, how would it, that instrument be if it was equivalent to, to a rent? It's actually quite um, useful at the minute. A year ago, let's say, the 40-year indexed guilt had a yield of negative two, and it's hard for people to get their heads around, what do you mean by an inflation-linked guilt that goes up, but the yield is negative two? And we can talk all day about the accuracy of the maths because it needs to be accurate. But at the minute, the yield is zero. So all of the maths collapses down to a 40-year billion pound investment gives you a billion pounds back if you ignore the word inflation. That means you're going to get two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, 40 times multiplied by a thing called inflation. Then you can look at rental yields in London. Two and a half is really low. <laughs> but yes, you see, see some wonderful places which are yields as low as two and a half. And that's just like the income-only strip on a publicly traded inflation-linked guilt. Exactly the same, obviously. <laughs> so we do that kind of transformation. And then we built a machine that can look at every property in every town and every picture and every floor plan and every EPC certificate and say, well, we've noticed when you look at all of them, all million properties available for sale and the million that sells during the year and there's still a million left or a couple of million random properties – through the internet, and residential rental yields are inversely correlated with absolute house prices, a distinct slope downwards as you yield on the y-axis and house price on the x-axis, it slopes downwards. Value for money. If you have three people renting three one-bedroom departments paying 500 each, these are very low-value departments, even in a place like Liverpool, when you add up 500 three times to 1,500, you get really nice houses in Liverpool, for 1500 month, not in Croydon, not in Barnes, but in Liverpool, 1500 is a pretty good number. The value of the house you can rent for 1500 is more than three times the three individual apartments. Better value for money. And that's what a rental yield means. And so I've stopped saying inversely correlated with and started to explain to people it's better value for money if you rent a bigger place. Oh, now I see what you're getting at. So that means that a financial institution that was willing to accept rent instead of a mortgage repayment on a loan, we get a higher yield if they encourage people to rent the smallest and ugliest place. You know, your yields are going to go up. And every buy-to-let landlord knows this, that if you're living in London and you like walking around to your buy-to-let apartment and doing it up, these are expensive places. Yeah. So you're going to invest in something thinking, 
well, the yields are lower in London, but maybe London will outpace Liverpool in terms of capital gains, etc. Or Middlesbrough. So these yield differentials persist because the country is fragmented and diverse. When you have a contract like ours in which you gently transfer the value of the property to the tenant, there is no capital gain or very limited capital gain. So now the yield differentials are stuck. Why is it that you can get £30 million per billion invested over and over again in London and 100 in Middlesbrough compared to 30 over and over again for two human generations? Hmm. I don't think those portfolios are worth the same. I don't think ordinary people, if you took the capital gain away, would say, well, I'm quite comfortable getting 100 in Middlesbrough and selling that and getting 30 in London over and over again for two human generations. I look at it and think, those properties are not the same. The one throwing out 100 million is worth more. It just is. And people look at you blankly and say, how can an apartment in Middlesbrough be worth more than you can buy and sell an apartment in Middlesbrough? The answer is, well, it's not. The apartment is completely appropriately priced. But 10,000 apartments where the rent is commingled and the You've broken that asset into two economic units, one which wobbles around and one which is stable. One's a bond and one's an equity. And if you separate them out and sell the equity, to, it's like I'm an M&A banker. I've yeah, yeah. broken up companies and sold them in pieces. And they, they, the two pieces don't add up to the whole. They just don't. When you then take the rent and tranche it, and this is a repeated theme, it takes a little bit of time to absorb the simplicity of it. You know, a family that puts in a 20% deposit is pretty generous for a house. But why wouldn't a bond investor put in the first 20 and another bond investor put in the more secure 80? And the first investor says, well, I'm taking all the risk, all of it. I get wiped out completely before the other investor loses a penny. So I want more than 20% of the rent. And that rental stream can be divided into two, which is entirely normal with a mortgage, except the first investor is a family with absolutely everything to risk. Whereas you can find institutions, if you structure it correctly, who say, Ah, I can understand why putting in 20 and getting more than 20 of the rent is a decent deal. It's, at that point, it's just ass. But the yeah. concept is very simple. Just yeah. slice it in two. Yeah, it's taking me back to my, my university days with structured finance. It is uh, just that simple. <laughs> it is just the maths. And you take out the, the emotion of it. And the fact it's a house is what is their future income stream. As you said, like people are sort of fairly comfortable with the idea in many financial products. But their house it, it seems to be different. And I think what's interesting as well is that idea of, on the one hand, you've got a huge bank with you know, hundreds of millions of people who are highly educated in finance, know all the terminology. And the other one, you've got somebody who just wants their family home. And that's an imbalance. You can see why the, the man on the street is losing out often because uh, you know, the odds are stacked against him. And suddenly you're stacking together and you're creating you know, a big portfolio of, of properties and, and of renters. Suddenly that evens out that. Absolutely. A coordinator, like a community organizer, that's essentially what Pathway is. We say to people, look, you have the amount that you can afford. Uh, your neighbor has a different amount and they have a different time horizon that they want to live next door to you. But when you add up your two amounts of rent, if you can't pay on a day when they can or vice versa, combination of those two people is just more stable. Multiply that by 5,000. Now you've got 10,000 independent risks. It's just a different risk. That no one of those people individually can say, I'll just do a whip around my neighborhood. How would you like to you know, add our rent together? Create something that's less risky than a normal rent so it can be financed at lower terms in the bond markets. Well, no one person can do that. Go back to the consumer side and you think about, I mean, this is probably the most important point. If I was looking to rent a place and I went to right move, mechanically, I would say, what do I feel comfortable paying and where? And up would come a, a list of options. And we just said, just do that. So if I was going to buy a house, I'd go to Zoopla. And within seconds, I would say, this mortgage calculator indicates I can borrow about four times income and my grandmother will give me 50,000. I'd add A and B and enter C and look at everything downwards. In many parts of the country, your rental yields are above four times income. But you'll only get that by saying the amount you feel comfortable paying divided by the local rental yield is higher than the banks will lend you. You, you enter the wrong number into Zoopla and then you start walking down the wrong street and looking at the... It's that basic that with our system, you were holding in your hand a calculator that says, yeah, you might be able to buy this house. So Halifax says 400000 and we say, well, no, six fifty. I mean, the the differences are profound. They're not small. And you discover that within seconds walking around the street, and we want to guide you as you're standing in the garden, 
And so we'll go upstairs and check out if you, if you know the roof needs insulating, and guide you as you're perambulating. That's that's the vision. <laughs> it's not a, it is not about um, numbers. There's no APR, SVR, SDLT, or LTV. We just well, what's that? It's like go and have a look. Just the, does this thing thing need doing up? We're about to buy it together. We're about to do this together for 35 years. Let's just go do the thing and, and make the financial services embedded inside that experience. It's just. You know, make, make, make it disappear. Service. Make it a service. <laughs> so it's it, it really, um, I hope you find the comparison flattering, but you know, David Breer's 11FS uh, podcast uh, about 18 months ago was titled, you know, people aren't really looking for a mortgage. They want to buy a house. Yeah. And we sat and listened to that and thought, well, let's just make the whole experience, make the finance disappear into a friendly conversation with your co-investor. Yeah. Should we do the roof? Yeah, reckon solar panels will bring the energy prices down for you. You will save money. Let's go do that. We've got money. All we have is money. We've got a billion pounds burning a hole in our pocket at a yield of zero. I mean, on, on the energy one, I spoke to, to, to somebody, I'll hopefully interview her one day as well, who's trying to get a green energy fintech off the ground. And she said one of the big problems here is if you want to buy solar panels for the house, they are an unsecured loan you're paying over five years. And he said, but it's to make my house better and to bring my costs down. The mortgage company is not interested. Debt consolidation and bringing your energy bills down are the two like product pipeline initiatives that it, it, immediately we get this off the ground. Uh, if your bills go down and you are a better tenant because you're spending less each month and the value of the house we share, the mortgage is downside only. So mathematically, we own something that's more valuable. The bank does not. And it's we bought the property. So our security interest is perfect. It's not unsecured. We just bought the house. It's so simple. Just we make money if it's a better house. Even if you default, we have to sell the house. It's a more valuable house and we own it. Yeah. So why would we not want to do it? Oh, and by the way, it's good for the environment. And it's just one transaction. We bought a house. We put up solar panels. Why is that complicated? <laughs> it's, like, it's the security interest, the downside only, the this and that and the other. Banks are overcomplicating it. Yeah. We just bought a house and did what was right for the environment. Saved money for the tenant. We're buddies. We're working together. It's not simple, but it's not complicated either. It's like having the rich relative that we all want. We all want the rich relative we could go to and sort this out. The rich relative is not your grandfather. It's other people's grandfathers with their retirement savings. It's just it's the community's grandfather. <laughs> I love it. Obviously, it is a lot about people. So you've got the investment side. I think it's important to fund this and to show that this is this is something that big finance can can buy into. But you know, for most people listening, it's easier to interpret at the consumer level. And you've got a lovely little video there that you've you've produced that shows the the pathway story. And as I was watching it, there's there's a line there that says renting while saving to buy is brutal. And it is. I mean, it's such a difficult thing to do. And so obviously so that you're paying, you know, monthly the rent for the house that you're in. And at the same time, the house you're wanting to buy is getting more expensive. And you're also supposed to be saving up enough that somehow you can pay 10%, 20% down on this house. And it can just feel like a hamster wheel that there, there's no way off of it. And that doesn't take a genius to see. It doesn't take 20 years working in lending to see. This is something everyone knows, but it's persisted for so long. So on that point in your video, you, you say you're making the down payment optional. And what I want to know is, how have we allowed this to persist for so long? And two, what are you doing to, to fix it? How does the pathway uh, model make a down payment an option? So um, let's preface this by saying we're forming a club to demonstrate um, how this will work in practice. I'm going to describe the world as I want it to be, as I believe it to be, and the, all the maths checks out. But there is a behavioral uh, challenge that the institutions who can make it work would like to see precedent. And nothing has ever been uh, invented with precedent. And that's a fairly simple statement. There was no fire before someone decided, let's cook with fire. Uh, somebody invented the wheel. There was no Tesla before Tesla. What we're going to do, essentially, is to offer people the model that demonstrates that the risk that they're worried about is small. And then pre-assemble the cash flows so that we can turn the machine on very quickly. And then auction it. <laughs> it's very straightforward. The auction will clear at a certain price. So a price discovery process which involves PhD mathematicians looking at a model that we've built and interrogating it and stressing it and then saying there are individuals, thousands of them, who've been through the preliminary screen so that each individual atomized component of this independent system has been put through the same rigorous tests 
that any other landlord would ask people to go through. We've looked at their income, their income patterns. We've, if necessary, gone to for references. But they've done this during that five, six, seven year journey when you're struggling to get your deposit. Well, that's plenty of time for us to say, well, let's spend five, six, seven minutes using open banking to evaluate whether you're someone who is a good risk. And that process, the technology is, you know, in 2015, that was science fiction. In 2018, the open banking protocols were agreed. We're now way down the track in 2023, and you can buy it on the SaaS basis. So we have partners using machine learning and open banking and selling that to us on a per um, applicant basis. We then plug that into a marketing machine that says, would you like to pay rent and have nothing versus joining this club in which it's possible you might pay the exact same amount of rent but own a property that will be worth a million pounds in a place like Brighton, Property values grew by a factor of six in 25 years. So you take a typical starter home that you could rent in Brighton, you probably have two million pounds of the property at the end of the pathway. It's a fairly simple proposition. Zero, <laughs> two million. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, that number would be zero to 600,000 in Newcastle because there are enormous variations across the country. But places like Hackney, London, Brighton, Bristol, Exeter, huge. And places like you know, Newcastle, Liverpool, Toxteth, South City, just uh, huge variations, enormous. So very high yields um, and different property uh, price rises. And we just analyze that because the data, if you created a company and you were trying to guess whether people would default on a credit card, the data analysis is vastly more complicated than looking at rental yields because the spread of uh, stable rental yields is enormous. You know, 2% in parts of Exeter, for example, then you slide all the way up to 4 and 5% in Birmingham, 6 and 7% in Manchester, and 7 and 8% in Liverpool. If you look down from the sky at Anfield Stadium, you know, the cop end is at the north, and there are yields of 7. You go around behind Sakeni Dalskali Station, and, you know, 100 basis points higher. If you go to the east, there is a park, so there are no yields. We're talking about that level of accuracy. The data's there. Yeah. So it's really, you know, if you step back and, and, and say... Let's look at it from a finance point of view. You can price for risk by taking different risks. Yeah, and what I love about it as a as a data exercise is that well, they've just bought a house, and you look at house prices in the street or whatever. You know, the last time a house sold in the street was four years ago, and then you've got to say, well, this one's bigger, that one's smaller, that one has a garden, that one doesn't. This one's ten years old, that one's this years old. It's so irregular that you buy a house, and okay, you take mortgages more often because people refinance, but you take 100 houses anywhere in, in the UK, that's only some of the people have got a mortgage, and only some of that's recent, but everybody else is renting, and everyone else is renting, and they're renewing their rent every year, every two years, depending on their lease. That data is fresh, it's coming through, it's not complicated by all the other changes you might have, it's just what is the rental for, for that house. Cash in, cash out, transparent, monthly, stable, um, predictable. When you look at the value of a portfolio of houses, you're asking the theoretical question, and let's put this in the context of a buy and hold investor like a pension fund. I'm buying an asset, I intend to hold it for 40 years. The house next door is sold under emergency circumstances by people who are not you. And so your accountant says, well, your asset went down because you might sell it. You have no intention of selling it. And the rent is coming in and the rent's very stable, coming in in cash, auditable, and you don't intend to sell it. If you own that house as a pension fund, your asset fell. If you owned a bond secured on the rent for the house next door, the identical house where your identical twin is paying the identical rent, your bond value did not go down. Nothing happened. Your tenants paid their rent. Your retirees got their their pension. You could just ignore these present value fluctuations because they are completely irrelevant if you're cash flow matched. And in the context of pension investing, the rules which will allow the pension funds to look at the reality of their risk and model it and go to the regulator and say, look, there's really no risk here, are all changing as Britain exits the European Union and rewrites the Solvency II rules. The idea of Pathway creates a model that shows the pension fund, now that we don't have the Solvency II rules, we can look at cash flow. I have 10,000 people paying 10,000 a month, that's 10 million a month. The likelihood that they won't pay their rent is like 2%. <laughs> So 10,000 multiplied by 0.98, the models become bizarrely simple when you exit uh, the Solvency II regime. Most people don't know what that means, so you need an investment banker whose clients were pension funds to say, look, this is what it means, but it's not complicated. Yeah, and what I love about the the whole pathway concept is that 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 future award, that route to financial security, to sort of social mobility to some extent, has always been the house. And a lot of that's because it's this, this sort of mixed up world where on the one hand, you're paying rent. It's 
an expense that gets paid every month for the place you live in, and you get nothing for that. You could pay the exact same money for a house. It gets reported to the credit bureau, so you get better credit in the future. The asset grows in value, so you're building some wealth. And there's tax benefits and things as well. So all the reward is is on that ownership side. And it was hard to switch between the two, even though you know, you're making the same monthly payment for somewhere you live. Getting rid of the down payment, I think, is huge on that, especially in a world where house prices have been rising so fast. You say house prices rise Landlords also start raising your rent. So now you're trying to catch up, but you have to go faster because you need to get 20% more now than you did last year. Taking away the the down payment, I think, is is massive on that. The other thing you're looking at as well is the income caps. Now, obviously, income caps have a purpose uh, in the mortgage lending space, but they are a perennial problem in terms of how the stress test gets done. And you can be priced out or at least forced into dream home plan B or C or D or E. Those compromises are is really where the market is at, that a lot of people have no savings renters. In fact, mathematically, uh, was about 40% before the pandemic, and it rose because of pandemic-related uh, relief. But still, half of renters have just no savings at all, um, and they have credit card debt and, and, and other household debt. And then the other half has some savings, and then uh, obviously when you get to the top 10%, they have a lot of savings. But it's very skewed. When you start from a from a standing start, if you were in the middle of the country with a 5% yield and you're living in a house worth eight times income, and you take that 5% yield for five years, which is short to save for a deposit from a standing start, you've paid 25% of the value of the house you're living in. Then the banks cap the next mortgage at four. So you've paid 50% of the house you're about to buy to your first landlord, and then you need 10% on top. That 60% is so much money that if we just said, look, why don't we just charge you more yield if you're happy to move into that house now? Because you're just flinging money at your old landlord. It's just the maths are really simple. at 60% of the house you're about to buy if you have 10% on top of the half that you spent with your last landlord. And people are often living in rental yields of 6 or 7 or 8. So that 5% times 5 years could be higher because of the inverse correlation. And often you're living in houses which are worth less than eight times income, then that trade-off is not exactly one for one. But it's still roughly half the value of the house you're about to buy in cash, and people struggle to do that. And then at the point of purchase, if property prices spike 10% that year, that 10% deposit that you had is no longer enough, and you have to make a compromise, move around the corner, or, or wait for another year, or any number of things. The yields are sufficient and when you talked about paying the same rent as you would for buy, paying off a mortgage, you, you know, when your rent's a long-term and index to inflation, it's actually considerably higher. And those amounts are sufficient for people to rent their way to ownership. It, it would be possible for me to say, look, if I just add up all the rent and promise I'll pay it for 40 years in index to inflation, that's much more than the value of your house. Again, you know, I'm always going to apologize about descending into maths, but if you replay this podcast and just listen to it, the numbers are pretty simple. 5% yield for 40 years is 200% of the value of your house plus inflation. And inflation is currently double digit. So these are very, very large numbers. And so for someone to take a cold hard look and say, I'll, I'm, I'll take that amount of money, is taking a risk on one family. But if you add 9,999 other families and average it and slice it and crunch it, it's just, it's just massively different from um, taking mortgage risk and massively more stable because of the interest rate sensitivity of a two-year fixed mortgage or a five-year fixed mortgage is just not the same. People talk about it in one breath when we introduce the pathway concept. It all starts with, how does it work for one family? And I take a deep breath and explain. <laughs> and then they think, oh, good, I, I get that. Okay, so now I multiply by 10,000. Uh, no. <laughs> it's just that <laughs> it's at that point where you really want to understand how it works for one family. Just to make sure, does it appeal to the consumer? Well, Yes, but that's not the risk that we're passing on to the bondholder. We are essentially doing a, a consolidation, creating a conglomerate company with divisions that do different things, take the armaments division and sell that to arms manufacturers, take the hotel division and sell that to hoteliers, and they pay different prices. So it's, it's really a breakup of a portfolio that, that creates the value. What is the, the revenue metric, people ask me when I say, well, We'll buy a house and then we'll securitize the rent. They say, so how many people? I say, well, I, I don't know. And I do care about the person, but we measure the metric as 5 million a month. So that could be, 
you know, a million pound house in London or a hundred thousand pound apartment in, in Toxteth. It's 10 times the number of people, the numbers of people for the bond market is, is irrelevant. Is it 5 million a month? Is it not? Is it indexed RPI, CPI? That's important. It's an indexed upwards only. That's important. And then the, the individual tenants have embedded options in the lease. So can you model out the embedded optionality that the tenant can choose to sell when they want? Makes it sound as though the cash flow stream is short if you have a, a breakable tenancy. But people often forget if we say, we have a straight line transfer of the value of the property you bought with a zero deposit from zero to 100. You'll own it in 40 years or 38 years or 37 years, depending on the value, the contract you struck. But if you sold halfway through, we still own the other half. And there is a human tendency for people to want to sell when the prices have spiked. So it's probably gone up faster than inflation because properties tend to do so. And so we have a little bit of an upward bias in terms of property prices rising. But complete exposure if it falls because we don't, we're not lending you money. Yeah. We're buying an asset that could go down and we share the down as well as the up. And at a stroke, we've eliminated negative equity. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a few things that are important. One, negative equity. That's great to take that stress off there and you say, well, I am going to just keep paying. I know it will come back in a year or two or five or ten. I'm happy to keep paying. Two, I think what I want to pick up on here is you talked about the flexibility to be able to sell out and change because obviously houses, we grow and upsize and downsize depending on our life changes. I think one of the risks is that people listening to the pathway model, there's some terminology that sounds a little bit like timeshare, which is like an industry that has a very negative connotation with locking people into things forever. And that's not at all the situation you have. People do have this flexibility that if you started with a small house in a, in a trendy part of London, now you've got two kids and you want to move out to the suburbs or you want to move up to, to Liverpool or to Leeds and to get some more space in the countryside, you can do that. This is owning a house. You don't have any other restrictions than if you bought a house. The, the, I think the right way to think about it, um, I, I put on my Nigerian hat for a, a second, Nigeria is a majority Muslim country. I, my family comes from the uh, Igbo part of the southeast, so a Christian region. But if you had a Sharia mortgage, you would essentially be saying the bank would, in its own name, acquire a property in partnership with you. You've chosen the house. The bank holds that in a trust for you. and You get to treat it as your house. You have to insure it and maintain it. So you can paint the walls and plant the trees in the garden. Then the bank would say, can you pay me rent? Because I actually bought the property for you. And Sharia mortgages tend not to be index linked. So we slipped in index linked. And then we essentially said, well, if you got rid of the department so of the deposit, so you can just start at zero, we would allow you to do a straight line transfer of the time. You know, this is a 38 year arrangement. Last time I checked, that's like 19 years is halfway through. So you can have a conversation with someone in which you can say, well, 19, if you, how old are your children? In 19 years, is that, is that about the right time when you might want to trade out? So we know with precision at the end of year 19, your share will be half because of that declining balance thing that I, I can't describe in a podcast. It's too complex. People buy mortgages with no real idea in year seven and a half, how much of my mortgage will I pay down if it's a two-year fixed and it reverts to a standard variable, blah, blah, blah. So why do that? Why not just say halfway through you, you own half? So now we can say with precision, we're sharing the up and the down. Property prices tend to drift up. So we're just going to say we probably make some money. It's enough. And we'll also be able to say, well, on the afternoon of the 14th of September in the year 2043, you're 20 years on from now, September. Okay, so 20 years and six months. And then the original contract was 32. So we take 23 divided by 32. Now that's a lot of words. Try saying that in declining balance terms. It's just more words. So, what we do, so we can put a little slider and gamify it, show you this house on this specific day. And then the next little slider says, but that house is in a region that grew 2% faster than inflation in the last 25 years. What if it grew 1%? You know, so you know the exact percentage of an unknown thing, but it's not a weird thing. It grows or shrinks. So the slider has a negative number. Imagine you had nothing. And then now you own 50% of something which fell 20%. It's not nothing. 50% of something started off with 300,000. It fell 1% a year relentlessly for 20 years. Rarely happens, but it might. And now you own 50% of a thing that's in real terms worth 200,000. That's 100,000 you wouldn't have had. Yeah. But you nudge that slider from fell 1% a year for 15 years to grew 1% a year for 15 years. That 2% difference or something that rises 2% over a 40-year pathway goes up a factor of 2.2. 2. 
So a 500,000 pound apartment in Croydon will be worth a million one in 40 years time if it grew as fast as the British economy. So when we do that maths, we gamify the process by saying to people, well, you could put in nothing and pay as a 6% yield. If you have a lifetime ISA, you would use that money and put in a deposit because the government's going to sign a check and give you an, an uplift and you'd be mad not to use that. If the money is coming from your grandmother, there's no tax difference between putting in money to shorten your pathway on our system or using it for your honeymoon. It's just you choose. Or you could redo the kitchen. So all of a sudden, it doesn't sound like a financial product. We're giving you options about whether we put in all the money or you put in part or any combination of the two. But if we have 10,000 tenants, how are you going to redo the kitchen? We'll say, I know someone who can redo your kitchen because I've got 10,000 tenants. Let me help you with that. Oh, you want me to put in more money to redo your kitchen? Well, I'm about to give you 250,000. Yeah, what if I add another 25? It's 10%. Yeah, I think you're good for the money because I just did an algorithmic assessment of your ability to pay using open banking and I can see you're good for the money. So we're now saying, let's own this house jointly together and we will do everything we can to make sure it is the best house, that it's good value for money, that we insulate the roof, that we put solar panels up there if that makes the heating bills come down. Then we say, well, you get the benefit of the heating bills. The turnaround time, this is probably the sweet spot of the pathway system. If you eliminate your energy bills, that's an enormous percentage of your rent, like three or 4,000 pounds of energy bills in a big house, where your rent might be, for a big house, 30,000. Well, that's 10% of your rent. If we just eliminate that by redoing the house, you save money. How do we get repaid? Well, we just add a little bit to your rent. Or let the pathway that was 32 years drift out to 33 or 34 or 35 years, depending on the ratio between the amount we're putting in yeah. and your willingness to pay, or any combination of the two, any infinite variation between I'll raise my amount per day a little and I'll let it get longer a little. So we just gamify it, just put two little sliders, infinite variations of personalized financing. That mass customization is so much easier than financial <laughs> services, where it's just numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not physics anymore, it's not material yeah, science. <laughs> yeah, it is so much easier. And it's the thing, when you, you talk about it like that, it just makes so much more sense. Yeah, if you contrast that to the rental situation that you're just <laughs> paying rent and it just keeps going to somebody else and every now and again you change houses and if you want a better kitchen, you've, you've got to move to a more expensive house and pay that and pay that. It's such a pleasant path <laughs> to ownership. And I think that the, the lifestyle benefits are clear for consumers, but even for communities are massive. And the more people that own their houses, the better the community is. It's a well-established uh, fact in economics that you know, just in terms of all the antisocial behavior and stuff, all is improved when people own their houses. They take more care of the public land as well, and they feel invested in communities. That stability to stay in the same area, go to the schools, own those properties is huge. And it does feel like things like down payments on houses have been keeping people out of an investment that, sure, there's some mortgages that that default. But if you think about the underlying asset, long, long histories of becoming more valuable, people always need somewhere to live other than, you know, some areas will go up and down. But the amount of scrutiny that you go through for a mortgage is exceptional for how little the credit risk of the individual really is in, in, in that, um, that scheme. Probably just to, to end by zooming out a little bit, literally on, on the map, that we start our process to, to make a financial services feel like you're searching Zoopla and right move. We only ask two questions for our underwriting process, it, it, two fundamental questions. One, how much do you feel comfortable paying and where would you like to live? And in those two questions, if you analyze the data, you know what's the normal yield in that area. I mean, by area, I mean granularly. You mean around the corner where it's a new build or on this street where there are three-bedroom houses. If you tell me that specific house, there's 100 basis points of yield differential. And the data allows you to define neighborhood as, I would like to live on a leafy street and I want it to be this close to the tube station and near that, that school. And we have that conversation, human being to human being, with the applicant. And it takes a few minutes. And there's like a 100 basis point swing in the yield and then you look at 80 mortgage banks saying, well, if I just stick to the best people with all the cash, you know, then I can price my mortgage up, you know, 15 basis points. Yeah. We just talk to people and say, well, 
the yields are higher over there. I'd recommend you go where they're lower because it's better value for money. You say that, and then you say, have you thought about insuring your house? I know a bloke, a panel of insurers, you know, they're going to give me a kickback if I put you, I do that 10,000 times, my cost of customer acquisition plummets because I'm fluidly helping you yeah. at the point of move. Think about how you want to do the house, where you want to live, guide you to value for money. That human conversation happens because a human being talks to a human being sitting in front of some data. That's the, the future of financial services as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> enough value as a standalone business, like, whether you have a free house at the end or not. You notice it more when you travel, but I mean, every time I've moved abroad, you land and then even if you're just renting, people are like, where, where do you want to stay? So, well, I, I don't know this. And if you think of a place like London, there's just so many neighborhoods. Maybe there's a neighborhood that fits my needs. I've not heard of just down the corner, equally close to the tube station, but it's on a different line or it's the other side of the circle. And having access to you know, all the things that when you buy the house, he has all the things that come with it is great enough. And then you know, at the end, you get given a, <laughs> given a house. So I think for consumers, there's a lot of clear incentives. Sure, the financing may be a bit complicated for them, but for the investors, that's easy. That's bread and butter. They, they're very used to that. So the two parts don't necessarily need to fully understand each other, but both parts are equally clear <laughs> to the right audience. If somebody listening is interested in learning more about pathway, maybe even getting involved, what's the place for them to go to learn more for them to sort of have that conversation and see what it's about uh, for themselves in detail? For people interested personally or, or investors who want to understand how we're going to build an extremely valuable consumer-facing business, our site is being built in public. We prefer to do things open. So you will see the typos and you'll see things change in our day. And it's called The Pathway Club. Uh, you just put a dot before the words uh, club. So the pathway dot club, and for people who want to understand the, let's say, the more professional investor, bond investor side, if you look at E.K. Udechuku on, on LinkedIn, try to post an article that deconstructs the inflation linked bond deals uh, every day and just saying to people, look, this half trillion pound niche called the guilt market, <laughs> the inflation linked guilt market is not that obscure. It's big and it's transparent and will price properties in relation to that benchmark and just, just, just describe what people will see when they dig a little bit deeper. So LinkedIn and our, our website. Perfect. I'll put those links in the show notes as well. I think, uh, yeah, you're talking about bond markets, I guess, in some ways, those are just based on tax incomes from a million different earnings of, of consumers. So very similar once you kind of filter out who's who's doing what. But EK, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. And as I said before we started recording, I know there's a lot of kind of innovation happening in the mortgage space because it is such a desperate problem that people can see well how can i as somebody who pays money every month to live not pay that for a mortgage why are there there's so many of these barriers that kind of drag over from 20 30 40 years ago i mean my parents would have been having the same problem to buy their first house and a lot of the innovation that's there is making it a little bit easier it's making it a little bit easier here or a little bit easier there maybe taking a little bit of money off but i think that the pathway model is so bold that it's a proper reimagining of what this needs to be and and it's not just a consumer facing business this is not about standing alone as a new fintech that is taking in venture capital and then spending that money saying the bottom side the funding side is desperate for something like this as well yeah it's just that's a great marriage of of the two that with all the negative news all the cost of living crisis that is finally a way to relieve some of that stress at the risk of running over time our platform asks what do you feel comfortable paying. If the bank's cap mortgages at four times and you're living in a house worth eight times income, try plugging in 60% of your current rent and see what you can buy for 60. Just within seconds, you'll see places with no deposit. And then you decide. It's not, it's not about getting the rent up or getting more money from us. We're getting a yield, whether we lend you know, half a million to a middle-class family or 250,000 rather to two separate people. It's all the same to us. Yeah. So you can just decide, I want to cut my rent and own and have no deposit. Yeah. Just do that. <laughs> just <laughs> It'd be a enough, difficult enough question with or in there. Do you want to cut that or that or that? And, and you're able to do and, 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 and. And I love the terminology. That's sort of how much are you comfortable to pay? Because again, it strips away some of all this terminology and things that makes home ownership unattainable. I mean, obviously the biggest things are are the actual finances that you have to pay down, but the terminology doesn't help all that sort of barriers that make you unsure of which mortgage to take, unsure of how you're going to repay it, unsure of 
uh, you know, what's happening. And the mortgage space maybe uh, is a little bit better controlled than others. But in financial services in general, people can make the wrong product choices because they don't necessarily understand. And how much you're comfortable paying, people can sit down and say, honey, how much are we comfortable paying? Put a number in and see. And as you said, that's it. When I bought my first house in South Africa, my now wife, my brother and I bought a house together. We got a 108% mortgage. So it was enough to buy the house, to pay for the fees of buying the house and to buy furniture. That doesn't exist anymore. And so when you buy a house, you know, you've got all the expenses of the, the solicitors, the surveys, the new house, you know, how you want to furnish it maybe and, and, and fix up things that are falling down. So even the people who have got money saved for a down payment, they can choose they can yeah, choose hundred and eight percent or ninety two percent you know within reason a, an algorithmic analysis of whether you are comfortable paying the number you say you're comfortable will allow us to say, well, then we'll give you what will turn out to be hundred and twenty percent of the value of the house. If that twenty percent reduced your gas bill to zero, you're a better tenant. Yeah. If we take your thirty percent credit card debt away and say, "Can you pay me back in thirty two years, your monthly outgoings go down. You're a safer tenant. We'll figure out whether you've got enough money to pay us 32 years from now because we tacked it on the end. It's just so much flexibility when you look at the people's life, you know, in totality. Well, EK, I think it's one of the most exciting projects I've had on here. So I'm definitely going to be watching. As a South African, you'll be pleased to know that in the mid 80s, when I was working for Morgan Stanley, I went to Johannesburg and heard about an offset mortgage in Africa and people running around thinking, how can we you know, move money around electronically in Africa? Those were the first times those fintech concepts and product innovation concepts came to me. And, and I was a fig banker in London, in Europe, so it wasn't unsophisticated. So a lot of this innovation comes out of, um, you know, just raw human need from all over the world. Necessity finds a way. But yeah, congratulations. I think that's a fantastic idea. I think that there's stuff for people to dig into to understand the numbers. As you say, a little bit intimidating maybe to think of, but as soon as you get into the math, <laughs> almost why has nobody done it before? Thank you again for your time. Brendan, it's been uh, a pleasure and an honor. And thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you all for listening. Please do look for and follow the show on your favorite podcast platform and share the updates widely on LinkedIn, where lending nerds are found in our largest concentration. Plus, send me a connection request while you're there. This show is written and recorded by myself, Brendan LaGrange in Brighton, England, and edited by Fina Charlson of FC Productions. Show music is by I Am Wake, and you can find show notes and written transcripts at www.howtolendmoneytostrangers.show or just www.htlmts.show, and I'll see you again next Thursday. Thursday.